Buenas tardes. Vamos, eh, bienvenidos al Centro de Tecnología Genómica. Vamos a dar inicio al seminario departamental que en esta ocasión le corresponde al Laboratorio de Biotecnología Experimental. Va a estar a cargo del doctor Ismael Vadillo Vargas, profesor asistente de Biología de Vector de Insectos en el Departamento de Entomología en el Centro de Investigación y Extensión AgriLife de Texas A&A en Hueslaco, Texas. Eh, entonces, adelante, doctor. Okay, thank you. Click. Hello, can you hear me? Okay. Well, it's easier for me to speak in English, so I'm gonna. Um, go ahead and give this seminar in English and I decided to use the title of what makes a vector an efficient vector. Um, the system that I did this work with is a plant patho system but this could be expanded to any any system. So in agricultural settings plant diseases um, need to conform to this disease triangle so in which we have a pathogen, a plant that is susceptible to that pathogen, but the environment that is conducive to that disease occurring. But for many instances, we also have in here a vector, and without the presence of the vector, the pathogen is not spread to the host, therefore disease doesn't occur. In the plant realm, these are going to be arthropods that are either mites or insects, most of them in, the, um, in this group of aphids. So more than 75% of all plant viruses that are um, recognized by the International Committee on Taxonomy of Viruses are transmitted from plant to plant by some sort of insect vector. And you could see here like different vectors and the shapes of the different virus particles that they do transmit. Most of them have like piercing, sucking mouth parts, so they have stylets, and only a small group is within this category here that have chewing mouth parts, so these are beetles in the order Coleoptera, but all of them nonetheless are the ways in which these plant viruses are carried from one plant to another. Insects also can transmit other types of, pl of, of plant pathogens. So this is probably one of the most well-known now is the Asian citrus psyllid that transmit the bacterial pathogen that causes um, citrus greening or Huang Longbin. But then there are hoppers that transmit phytoplasmas or spiroplasmas. And then other insects in this case are also beetles that are able to transmit fungi or nematodes. So therefore, insects are a big important part of understanding how these pathogens disseminate and developing ways to control the vectors so that we stop the pathogen from infecting the host and causing disease. In the plant viruses, in, with insect vectors, there are differences of infection between what we call the primary host versus the vector that in many cases is also a host because virus might repl replicate on it. So in this particular family, the Bungaviridae, like they are five genera and only one group, only one group is transmitted um, tospoviruses to plants by these insect vectors, which are very tiny thrips, but all the other ones are transmitted either by arthropods to humans or even mice. And when they infect the primary host, they cause a disease, like in this case, stomato um, spotted wilt, that results on the death of the plant. And it's similar with these other ones when they infect their animal host by causing diseases that could result on um, morbidity or mortality like hemorrhagic fever or renal failure. However, these 
these viruses do replicate in their arthropod or mammalian vector and despite replication in them that doesn't seem to cause any detrimental effects therefore this question of how this vector is an efficient vector and doesn't succumb to disease is a question that has puzzled vector biologists for a really long time. So I decided to study, um, and this was the work during my PhD and a short tenure as a, as a postdoc in the same lab. I worked with tomato spotted wheel virus. It's a member of the family Vingiviridae and specifically in the genus Tospovirus is the only one that has plant infecting members and the species TSWB, I will refer to it as TSWB for the rest of my talk, for tomato spotted wheel virus. And then this is a cartoon of the virion. So it has enveloped particles. The genome is divided into three segments that you could see inside. It is single-stranded, negative sense RNA, and then it carries some structural proteins which make up the virion which are the L, the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase in purple, the nucleocapsid in um, orange, which is what, what encapsidates that RNA, and then two viral glycoproteins, GN and GC, which span the membrane and are important for acquisition by the vector and infection of that vector, but are not very relevant for the infection of the plant host. And only during viral replication in the plant or in the insect vector, then these non-structural proteins are expressed. And they are NSM because it's used in movement, cell-to-cell -cell movement in plants through Plasmodesmata. And the NSS is the silencing suppressor. So during viral infection in the plant, at least, we know that the silencing suppressor is um, fighting back the defenses of the plant host. So it is transmitted from plant to plant exclusively by um, thrips, and the one that is the most significant is Franklinella occidentalis, so this is the western flower thrips. All thrips belong to the order Tyxanoptera, and this species in particular is in the family Tripidae, and it is a very important pest because it can feed on 244 plant, different plant species, it has a very short generation time and uh, is very fecund. So a female can lay up to 175 eggs in her life and they could rapidly develop insecticide resistance. So we had a really hard time fighting this little bug and is an efficient vector for TSWB but several other tospoviruses. When it feeds, this is the damage it causes just by feeding but when on top of the feeding damage it transmits a tospovirus, then you have a bigger issue to fight. So the transmission cycle between this insect and the plant virus that it transmits goes this way. So a female will lay the eggs into a plant that is infected with the virus, and once that um, larvae hatch and starts feeding, is the first insta larvae, the one that is going to be the most efficient at acquiring the virus. The second insta larvae can acquire, but acquisition efficiency decreases as development proceeds. And then once they, they become a prepupa, they usually drop to the soil, and the prepupa and pupa stages occur there, and they do not feed, so they can neither acquire or transmit. But the virus is passing from the larvae until here, so it's trans, um, transterially transmitted. And then finally, when the adults are close, both the female and the male can transmit the virus and there will be referrals, but only if they did acquire when they were a first or second insta larvae. So the female will lay more eggs, but the virus is not transovarially transmitted, so it's not um, passed from mother or, pa or from the parents to the offspring, so the, life, the, the transmission cycle needs to start again. If we take a deeper look into this interaction, we call this a persistent propagative transmission. And if we look at a thrips and take a look inside of its body, when it starts feeding on an infected plant, it's going to acquire particles of the virus that will traverse in the digestive tract. And it is specifically in the meat gut that it interacts with a still unknown receptor for transmission to occur, 
and then the virus enters into the midgut epithelial cells and replicates there for the first time. It has to escape the midgut escape barrier and then by some mean reach the salivary glands over here that then are another tissue infected by the virus. A second round of replication takes place there and finally like when it's feeding mix of saliva and virus particles are then deposited onto a healthy but susceptible plant and that's how you get the infection in a new host going. So this is a, 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 another look of the internal um, anatomy of the insect and in here what I'm going to point to you is like the green is looking at an antibody binding specifically to the virus and in here you could see like it's just infecting this area of the midgut but not the foregut so not the first portion of the digestive tract but the middle portion and then as time passes that foci of infection keeps increasing so because the virus is replicating and is disseminating through that epithelium and then then you get a much more higher infection to the point that all the midgut is extensively infected but the cardiac um, separation here from the foregut is basically the delimitation of the infection and then it finally moves from the midgut into these um, tubular structures that connect the midgut and in here you see more of that infection with the primary salivary gland and you see like how the infection is moving now through these ducts which are right here and then finally a primary salivary gland is heavily infected and the efferent duct and then in here you could see one primary salivary gland heavily infected not the other though so that could also be important on the transmission how efficient that individual would be on transmitting the pathogen but you see that midgut infection is no longer existent when now this insect that started acquisition as a larvae became an adult this was work conducted in the same lab by another PhD student and then knowing now this extensive infection of the vector and how it's moving within the insect then basically I decided to like focus on using proteomic tools and my first um, stop at this was to look and try to explore is this proteomic tool gonna be any useful um, to study this system when we don't have a lot of genomic resources for trips so in my initial experiment, I wanted to explore the proteome of healthy larvae. I wanted to focus on the larvae because it's the stage that can acquire the virus. And if I could use it to just explore proteins within a healthy larvae, then I could then try to use it to understand the infection of the virus in that stage. So I used two-dimensional gel electrophoresis coupled with mass spectrometry and I had to manually collect 600 larvae for the protein extractions. They were separated um, in the first and second dimension and I, I really think like you're familiar with um, the technique. So you separate them by isoelectric charge and then by molecular mass. Um, the proteins are visualized in the gel by staining with Comasi. Um, brilliant blue G250 and then like the spots are all manually excised and then are um, subjected to trypsin to like um, chop the, the protein into peptides and those were subjected to um, mass spect and then mask of software was used to compare like these um, generated fragments or peptides with theoretical fragmentation patterns from all metasoans in um, NCBI. So this is how that gel looked like and that was the very first gel I ever ran so it kind of looked messy, it got way better with practice but I was able to identify it in here with my eyes around 194 spots that then were collected and then used in mass spectrometry and briefly basically using the Metasoan database in GenBank but a transcriptomic that was generated in the lab, I was able to identify 47% with our TRIPS transcriptome and only 23% with the Metasoan database in NCBI, which suggests like TRIPS might be very, very different to everything else that's present there. 
they were 41% that had um, a match, but it wasn't significant for us to feel confident that that was indeed correct. And then 7% that were completely un unidentified that might represent things just unique to the ordered Tysanoptera or even perhaps just the Western flower trips. So just by using um, blast to go I identified them and provided distribution by their associated goal terms. And I'm not intending that you read all of them, but again, these are like the three main categories, biological processes, molecular function, and cellular component. So all of those different um, processes within those three are here, and then the number of sequences that hit that category are in the um, y-axis and of my interest were those involved in the immune system process or in cell um, killing because that might be what's going on in the vector when it's sustaining an infection with the propagative virus that is replicating within the vector because not all plant viruses transmitted by vectors do replicate in the vectors so because that ended up um, giving me some um, promising results, then I launched into this objective to identify TRIPS proteins, responsive proteins during the viral infection. So I use these proteomic tools that I just uh, adapted for using the healthy larvae. And my working hypothesis was that TSWV infected larvae might have a different um, protein profile compared to those that are non-infected. So, and I was kind of looking for either immune-related proteins that would play a role in modulating the outcome of that infection or that are involved in transport that allow the virus to move between, you know, different tissues until it's finally transmitted to a plant. So, the experiment setup was like this. I established two cohorts. They were larvae of similar age, so they all eclosed between 0 and 24 hours previous to me conducting the experiment. And then I used either healthy or infected tissue for an acquisition access period of three hours. Uh, we know that with this system, that's enough. For other systems, could be much longer. But then after that three hours, that tissue is removed. And we put um, green bean pods because they do not get infected with the virus. And then we allow the trips to feed for 24 hours. During that 24 hours, the group that was exposed to virus infected tissue, the virus particles that are in the lumen will be um, um, excreted. And only the particles that infect the midgut epithelial cells will be then present after the 24 hours. And that indicates active infection of that first um, tissue. So and this became the non-exposed and exposed treatment. And from there, I did an assessment of TSWV infection. So to make sure that my non-exposed is clear of virus, and my exposed, at least a proportion of them are infected with the virus. We know that not all the time you're going to get 100% infection, even though all of them were infe feeding on infected tissue. So, and I was trying to get at least 90% infection of this cohort to, to then move forward. So I did two-dimensional gel electrophoresis of those that reached the 90% infection cutoff. And then I then used um, the, the mass spec um, and proteomics to try to detect differentially expressed proteins um, to then identify those proteins and try to see what is the role they have in terms of biology that might be meaningful on the infection of this vector by the plant virus it transmits. I did four biological repetitions, these two treatments. For assessing infection, I did three, 10 trips randomly collected, and then those that reached that cutoff, I had to collect 600 trips manually from both treatments, and those were used for protein extraction 2D gel and then mass spec. And this is just like one example of how those gel look like. This, these ones do look way better than the first one I ever ran. So um, virus non-exposed and virus exposed, you can see that with your eye, you might not be able to tell anything different at all, despite always using the same total um, amount of protein per treatment and across the four replicates. So therefore, I had to use um, this program, so basically a, a computer software that you 
take pictures of your gel and then the, the program allows you to do um, a more quantitative analysis and when all of these images were overlapped, so eight different gels, I was able to identify a much higher number of total protein spots, so 488, and then I was able to identify 26 as being differentially expressed between both treatments. And then these were the two p-values I used, one more conservative and one just to like um, get a little bit further there. And all of them had at least a full change of 1.1 or higher. And for proteomics, this number could vary. Um, I guess for transcriptomics, it's, it's more of like always like people try to like shoot for, for the same type of value. But then in here is to just give you an idea of like how many were down-regulated by the viral infection, 62%, and the other 38% seem to be up-regulated. So we right here see a complex interaction between things going down but others going up. So then by using electrospray ionization mass spectrometry coupled with mass cut searches, and the databases used was again the Franklinella Occidentalis transcriptome generated in-house, the Metazoan database in NCBI at that particular time that keeps changing every day, and then we also compare with TSWB sequences uh, we were able to identify 37 different proteins, but from 26 spots that were differentially expressed. And that means that some protein spots had more than a single protein within them. We don't know if both of them are re reacting or one is the one that is driving that spot to look differentially expressed, but not the other. But nonetheless, out of, of the 26 spots that were differentially expressed, 37, um, were identified, but one had no match whatsoever. So this could be very unique to Tysanopterans or the Western flower trips. And then the majority of these identified proteins had sequence similarities to proteins from either other insects that, um, or have roles associated with the infection cycle of both plant infecting viruses, but some of them with animal infecting viruses in things like mosquitoes and plasmodium or mosquitoes and arboviruses. So when, again, I did a blast to go to try to, um, to provide a functional annotation, so I just, in this graph, selected some biological process and only molecular functions that might be relevant to this virus that is transmitted but also replicates within the vector and the progression of the insect life cycle. And then the categories are here, and then the numbers are in the X axis in this case and 86% of those 37 had some functional annotation associated to them. Uh, to my interest was this response to stimuli was 14, and here's a list of a number of them that might be important for fighting biotic or abiotic factors, but some of them might be important on the infection of TSWB in the Western flower trips. So those were like really the most interesting candidates to me. And then to summarize this part, like I was able to optimize proteomic tools and use it for the first time with Tysanopteran. Using healthy larvae, I identified 52% of the proteome of that um, stage. 57% of the, of the identified proteins had a provisional functional annotation, which 15 had purative functions in the innate immune responses. Um, 37 proteins were identified from 26 spots that were differentially expressed between infected and non-infected um, larvae and identified responsive candidate proteins that are involved or could be involved in different biological processes and molecular functions including that innate immune responses that might be important to like uh, modulating the outcome of infection, but that it results from transmission. And this suite of responsive proteins represent the first set ever in candidate proteins that are periodically involved between a Tysanopteran and any Tospovirus. So then once I felt very confident using these proteomic tools with this insect and this plant virus, I moved into my second objective, and it was to try to identify TRIPS interacting proteins, we call them TIPS 
for short. So, and in the experiment, I wanted to identify Franklin Hill accidentalis proteins, specifically from the larvae again, that directly interact with purified virus particles. So, I hypothesized that, well, this occurs in nature, so in order for a virus to enter into its insect vector, it needs to interact with the receptor and with many other proteins for replication to take place to move through that route and finally get the salivary glands and transmission to occur. So like they should be interacting with some viral, so from, with some insect proteins that if we identify those, those could be like ideal targets for control. So basically I had infected plants in the greenhouse. This particular plant is Datura stramonium. We use it because it doesn't die too quickly and it generates these beautiful symptoms that you know there should be a lot of viral particles there. And then we basically take that tissue and do viral purification using a um, sucrose gradient centrifugation process. And at this step, you could see this Y band is basically where all my TSWV particles are at, and that's what I collect, and that's my pure extract of the plant virus. And then I do a virus overlay assay. So basically, you have separated proteins of interest, in this case from the insect, into a two-dimensional gel, and pass that into a nitrocellulose membrane. And it's that membrane that you overlay with your prep, in this case, virus purif purified virus. And then those membranes are, are later on washed and treated with an antibody specifically to TSWV so that you could try to pinpoint what insect protein it's directly binding to the purified virus that then you could just try to identify by my spec. So basically these are how the overlay membranes look like. Control means like it had just the buffer. Virus overlay had the buffer in which I purify the virus, always using the same total concentration of TRIPS protein and the same um, concentration of purified virus in every single membrane. And the gradient, I didn't mention it before, but all the time was from three to 10 in pH, and here the different sizes. So I was able to identify five protein spots that were detected on three of the replicates, and three other ones that were detected all the time in four replicates out of four. So then basically at this step, this is what you go and try to do. Now you wanna like match your overlay membrane and the protein spots that you identify as binding to the purified virus back to a picking gel and then you want to like excise the protein spots from this gel and these are the ones that are trypsinized and subjected to the mass spectrometry. So basically like I overlay like images to the picking gels and to be very confident with identifying the right protein, I repeated the picking gel in three different gels and only when the ID was always the same, that's when we felt confident assigning that's what that protein is. So in here, I, I, labeled, I ended up labeled all of the protein spots on the course of the experiment and only the ones that really like um, interacted with purified virus are the ones that are highlighted here. And then they were collected and finally, um, oh, I guess before I go into, into the ID, I did, within this objective, the same experiment, but this time, rather than using the purified virus, I use, it's hard to see in the cartoon, but I use a, a recombinant glycoprotein, GN, because that is known to be involved on binding. So we know that that's the ligand in the virus that attached to a receptor on the vector. So by using that as a surrogate, I was trying to, like, either have like a confirmation of a potential receptor. So the rest is the same um, in terms of the experiment. And I'm just like he he here really trying to narrow it down to see if we could identify a receptor for entry of this virus into its insect vector because GN is known to be playing that role. So the overlays are exactly the same. In here, my, my antibody is specifically to GN and the overlay is treated with just buffer. Um, otherwise, like the membranes, uh, the, the gels and the membranes are identical. And in here, because 
out of two replicates, I was able to identify the same exact 11 protein spots. We felt confident with just like just doing two, and then some picking them from two picking gels and subjecting those for mass spectrometry. And this is basically what these um, what they were. All of those protein spots, once they were subjected to mass spectrometry and bioinformatics they turn out to just be five different tips. So all of them coalesce into just five proteins. And then in the previous study where I was looking for proteins that were responsive between infected and non-infected, three of those were also present in this other objective. And two were completely unique. So we had some proteins that seemed to be interacting but at the same time responsive, and others that are only interacting, but maybe they, they don't seem to be changing during infection. So I went ahead and I got a USDA predoctoral grant and was able to obtain it. And with that funding, I um, made antibodies to four. Um, now in that lab, they are making um, an antibody for the fifth one. But then very briefly, like a, a former student in the lab then, did the immunohistochemistry essay to see where these proteins are localized within, within the vector. And you could see like out of the four we generated antibodies for, they are present in the both tissues that are important for the virus infection and replication for successful transmission to occur. And all of this is in process to try to have a validation of these proteins from the vector interacting with the GN viral glycoprotein that is the one that, that is more interesting to us, and that's the, the student that was doing that work after I completed my PhD. And briefly, this is what she's doing and what she was seeing. So she is dissecting larval trips. If you've ever seen a trips, you know how small this is. This is just you know, 0.1 millimeters. So basically, you decapitate the insect, and then you get the internal organs out. And this is the midgut, what she's seeing here, just um, in a bright field, staying with DAPI, with phalloidin, with an acting antibody, and when it is merged, that is how you get a beautiful picture. So when she did that with the first antibody, so she is seeing it in the midgut and in the ends of those salivary glands. Um, T2 is present in the midgut, but kind of like more here, um, and then this is the part of the salivary gland that has it, and this is a whole full blown out midgut. And then tip three and four, they follow somehow a similar pattern present in those two tissues, maybe just in different areas. This is more on the periphery of the salivary gland. Um, and here, this is one salivary gland stuck with that first portion of the midgut. Um, and those were the four that we had. So finally, what are those proteins? So this is what they are, cyclophilin, enolase, a cuticular protein, an endocuticle glycoprotein, and a mitochondrial ATPase alpha. So I have in here listed, but I'm not gonna go through them, but this is how in other systems, these same proteins have been um, found to be involved either in interaction or responding to viral, viral infection of plant viruses that are persistent and propagative. And then these two that have Chitin binding domains seem to be very interesting because there's some promising um, or, or potential um, way that they might be a receptor. But a, a lot of other experiments need to be done to prove if it is a receptor indeed. And these ones I highlighted in boxes are the ones that were identifying the previous study that they were responsive, and here now they are also interactors. So, in conclusion for this part, five insect proteins were identified using overlay assays with either purified TSWV particles or that recombinant GN that was expressed in an E. coli. And then these proteins could be potentially involved on in these processes of virus attachment and entry, endocytosis or exocytosis to get in and out of these tissues during infection, or even the basal lamina remodeling for mid-gut barrier escape or perhaps like the salivary gland infection. And then these tips represent these unique targets for disrupting 
the interaction between this plant virus and this vector just to deter transmission from happening. So then once you have protein candidates, what then? So well, I wanted to like explore RNAi in this insect. Um, most of you might be familiar, but this is a biological process that happens in, in organisms to target and degrade messenger RNA in a sequence specific manner. And it's been exploited in um, a number of different systems to provide what is the role of a given gene or a given protein. And then it's been um, shown to have great potential for a tool of controlling insects. Indeed, it's been deemed like the, the modern insecticide, um, especially in agronomically important pests as we have, I guess, the luxury of making transgenic plants that could be someday a tool that people are allowed to use. So when we look at um, a phylogeny of all insect orders from Ishiwara et al. 2010, those were all the insect orders that previously RNAi was successfully done with these organisms. But Typhanoptera was not one of them. So, however, in a study in, uh, in, in our lab, so these were my, my um, advisors during the PhD, they had a study that generated that transcriptomic that I mentioned I've used, and they had evidence that the RNAi machinery it is present in Franklinilla occidentalis, probably in all insects in the order Typhanoptera. So I went into this quest to try to develop RNAi for thrips. Um, long story short, I ended up selecting this particular candidate, a vacuolar ATPase, syn synthase BATPase, which is this membrane-bound holoenzyme that comes to be formed from um, several subunits, and it is important to um, catalyze ATP um, hydrolysis and to transport solutes across membranes and regulate pH and so forth. And it is also involved in this clattering coated vesicle trafficking that people know that is important for infection of um, negative sense RNA viruses, including the family that TSWV is a member of. So I selected BATPase B as my target. And then I was so fortunate enough to have a fantastic undergraduate student that very patiently sat there and did micro-injection of trips females, so adults, that's the biggest stage, there's nothing else bigger than the female, and she injected double-stranded RNA that I generated in vitro into these insects and we conducted our bioassays. So this is basically what she's seen through her eyepieces in the injection arena. We have a, 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 a trips female and this is the, the needle to inject it with. You have to be very patient and very skillful, so not to kill it in the process. Um, and I wasn't as good as she was, really. So we did females. They were on the injection arena, injected just once through the stretchable membrane between the second and the third tergite of the abdomen. And then this is how much we could feed inside her. 12 nanoliters of solution. This is the fastest we could go um, in each individual. And the treatments we use were water, GFP, double-stranded RNA, and then BATPSB, double-stranded RNA. And this is the, the highest concentration we could get to go through the needle and into the insect, 80 nanograms per insect. We did two subsamples per treatment, and they were collected at two different time points, two days or, f or three days post-injection. The insects, because they were so small, we decided to pull them, and then they were either for RNA extraction, for real-time qPCR to quantify, or for protein extraction, because we were even trying to attempt to quantify differences at the protein level using Western bloods. And all of that work is summarized in this just one single slide. So in green, you have double-stranded GFP. And then in red, double-stranded BATPSB, two days post-injection and three days post-injection. And in the y-axis, the relative expression of BATPSB um, RNA. 
So you could see there is a reduction at uh, two days, which was like 23%, and just a little bit more at three days at 25, but after all that work, it was, I was amazed we were able to quantify and have this piece of evidence that we are silencing that one gene we were targeting. And then when we look at, at the protein level, so we are able to see that at two days, um, we have a reduction with our most important comparison, but overall with all of them, um, so with GFP, it was 25% reduction at two days post-injection, and then it, wasn't, it was a little bit lower at the three day, so it was just 19% um, decrease. So after being able for the first time to silence a gene in a Tysanopteran ever, and then have evidence at the transcript and at the protein level. So we were asking, okay, what next? Do we see a phenotype? So with the help of Brandy injecting all of these insects for me and help me count eggs or larvae or mortality, we did these experiments. 24 females were injected per treatment, so we have the same treatments. We also included 24 non-injected, just to see, you know, how, are they dying at the same rate or not? So after injection, the female trips were placed individually in these little shot cups with a piece of green bean, and then we just really went there daily to, to count if they were alive. The whole experiment was a complete um, randomized design and then we monitored them for as long as 14 days to then count female survival, but also the number of viable offspring that has been produced. So we're counting larvae that has emerged from eggs that that female laid. And then we had three independent experiments, and this was a couple of months of work. All this zoom into one um, slide. So you could see the treatments are color-coded with red being double-stranded BATPSB, and overall is the, the days post-injection are in the x-axis, and the proportion of living females in the y-axis. So you see like, well, yeah, they are gonna decrease in the non-injected, but overall is way more, um, or more quickly happening in the treated ones. Um, double-stranded GFP and water injection did have some effect on increasing mortality, but we see the highest at the six and seven days, and then from, um, and then from eight to 14 um, in comparison with the double-stranded injection with GFP. And then in terms of how many larvae they were able to produce, like you could see days after injection in the same um, um, x-axis, and the number of viable offspring per live female so here only, of course, live females are included. Dead ones are not going to produce anything. And then you could see that compared with all the treatments, so there is a reduction on number of viable offspring produced, which is significantly different with GFP at six days. Then we don't see the difference here, but it's significant again from day 10 to 14. So we obtained these two geno phenotypes that um, were along with silencing this particular gene. So we were able to deliver by injection the ATPase-B double-stranded RNA, well, and GFP double-stranded RNA was our control, our technical control. Um, but um, injection of this particular double-stranded RNA triggered a reduction of relative expression of this target gene at the mRNA level and at the protein abundance as well in female trips. So this knockdown resulted in two observable phenotypes, which were increased mortality and reduced fertility by specifically the number of viable offspring. This is the first demonstration that RNAi is functional in any member of the insect order Tysanoptera. It has the potential not to only affect the survival um, or generation time of the vector, but perhaps maybe even transmission of the pathogen and it could be um, used to exploit the molecular basis of the interaction of proteins that I identify, but we don't know what role they really play, other than it has an ID that suggests it's involved in so-and-so process. So since I joined Texas A&M in AgriLife Research in West Laco, I've been there for two years, 
So I just wanted to give you a snapshot of what I'm doing now that I'm um, a principal investigator in my own lab. So I wanted to study um, what I call a continuum of pathogenesis of a plant pathogen in an insect vector from causing no detrimental effect to causing detrimental effect. So in the first uh, or, or the, the side where no detrimental effect is seen, I'm interested and we have just begun to study Dalbulus matis, that's the corn leaf hopper, is a vector of these three plant pathogens that I'm hoping to get. But my PhD student is just doing a transcriptomic analysis to compare the vector with a closely related insect that is not capable of transmitting these pathogens to see if we can see within the vector what is different and that points to what is that make one a vector competent and the other do not transmit anything. Um, within this same system, we also um, are going to be looking at the microbiome just because vector competency might not only be um, as a result of the insect geno um, geno genetic makeup, it might be the microbes associated with it, so she will be exploring that as well. Um, then the system in between in which we see some detrimental effects, but not to the extent of killing it very quickly, is Bactericera coquerelli, that's the potato psyllid, and it transmits this pathogen with the long name Candidatus liberibacter solanaciarum, LSO for short, which causes zebra chip. And basically the main um, um, symptom is on the tuber, which forms like what looks like stripes of a zebra. Once it's fried, is when it becomes even more clear. So and within, within this system, we are looking from like very um, applied, what insecticides help us control it, just because the insecticide growers are using in the field seems to be um, pushing the insect to develop insecticide resistance. So we are evaluating other chemistries, also looking at a biocontrol agent. But then most recently, we just have done transcriptomic analysis of the salivary glands and the ovaries from infected and non-infected insects. And this is in the process of just like, we just finished making the de novo assembly of the transcriptome and are now trying to explore what is differentially expressed between the two treatments and among the, the, the different tissues in which the pathogen is replicating and is necessary for vertical or horizontal transmission to occur. And then the last system is one that um, I am just wanting to work with and we got an, inf an infestation of Tagoses oriciculus, that's the rice del facet in Texas in 2015. And we have specimens that we are testing, but like we didn't, like that was before I started in my post. So we don't have a colony of this, but it transmits this rice or hablanca virus that affects the leaf and the um, photo photosynthetic capacity of the plant, but also like damage the grain, or you might end up having an empty, no yield, no production of grain. Um, what is very striking on this system First is that the virus is only transmitted by the um, dominant recessive population. And then once they are heavily infected, the virus kills all of them. So it is on the other end of that spectrum um, that has my, my research interest on it. Without that, I have to acknowledge my two um, PhD advisors, Anna Whitfield and Dory Rodenberg, and all the members of the Plant Virus Vector Interaction Lab at KSU. They are now in, um, they, they have moved, they're no, no longer there. Um, Dr. Jaswaki, Hiro Masa, and John Tommy were the ones that trained me on proteomics and 2D gels. And I have special thanks to Frank White and Michelle Celia for more of the input. And this, this were where I did my second postdoc. And then this is my current group with now a, a, a team of people also working in, in collaboration with others like Gabe Hammer studying mosquito ecology and arbovirus um, interaction and the funding since I've joined Texas A&M. Um, if you have any questions, this is what a plant virus can cause to a crop. So, and my goal is to make healthy, staple ones. So, and that's 
Yes, Amen. If you have any questions. Uh huh. Preguntas. Hi, thank you for your presentation. I just have one quick question about the tomato spotted wilt virus, the one that you were studying. Mm -hmm. What's the current si situation about its spreading? Is it a big problem? It is, it is present in the United States. It is a big problem in certain areas like Florida, which is where I did my, my second postdoc. Um, in here, actually, though, like we see trips and we see the species that are able to transmit it, but we don't, I don't find TSWV here, but in certain areas in the country, like California or like Georgia, it is a big problem. And it's not only a pathogen of tomato. For example, in Georgia, they have a big problem with that virus on peanuts. So it is on the move. The other, the other concern we have is, if you recall that it has the genome segmented, into three different part, um, segments. So these viruses can um, do what we call reassortment. So they shuffle segments. So all of a sudden you could have one species and another species and if they shuffle segments, you have a new beast. So like they have the potential of doing that and there is a lot of problems with them. So people are trying to develop tools that could use maybe like transgenic plants to fight, but fight what exactly when they could ju just reassort that quickly. Okay, because that's on the genomic part of the, uh, of the thing. But in the, in the place that you went uh, with the protomic tools that you use, there's anything of your findings uh, tells you about why is this virus spreading just in certain areas or is this fact known before that, beforehand? We don't, we don't know why. A, po a possibility might be like just because I find a trips and it's western flower trips but it's a different population so it might not be one population that is competent and if you have then a, you know a species of the vector but it's no longer competent that might restrict for why you have an issue there and populations in other areas might be the ones that are capable of really picking it up and transmitting it so but but yeah like it, I was Amazed that I see the trips here and I keep looking and looking and I don't find TSWV in Texas actually. Not just the valley, but with colleagues in other areas, we don't find that in Texas. But areas like, yeah, like in the, in the eastern side of the country is a problem all the way from, Calif um, from Florida to Nueva York. Okay, that would be everything. Thank you. Okay. Mario. Hello, it is very elegant, very interesting study that combines vector competence studies and also molecular interaction and proteomics. It's very, very interesting and I'm very happy to have you here. And I have a question. You, you mentioned that uh, mm, you uh, used two uh, samples, uh, one uh, an infected trip mm -hmm. that were fed on on vegetables that were not infected with viruses, mm -hmm. and another um, insects that were infected by the vegetables. But you mentioned that uh, in that sample, some of them uh, were not infected. So that's why you did an experiment to try to show that we have a, a, a representative sample that the strips that were actually infected. Mm -hmm. But it caught me the attention that several of them were not infected actually by feeding on the infected, infected source. You know why it is the reason that the same population, one, one part of that population uh, are becoming infected that the other one is not? And the other thing is, it would be interesting to, to compare the two, the, the, the protomic profile of the, the two, the two um, specimens, those that are infected, are the, the, the ones that are infected, even feeding on the same infected source? Uh, I guess, yeah, I've, I've been having this conversation very recently with a lot of people about like, you have a colony, let's say we maintain insect colonies, 
and we call it, you know, that's viruliferous or bacteriliferous. But just when you open that cage and collect insects, not all of them are going to be carrying the pathogen. And this, uh, that's going to be the case for all the systems. Depending what system you're studying, it might be a higher proportion or a lower. For example, with this thrips colony of western flower thrips that we had in the lab, that as a matter of fact was collected in Hawaii, and is the one you being used in that lab for research, we are able to have 90 to 100% infection rate acquisition. But then other, with other insects or other populations, you might see different numbers. So in the same lab, other people working with the, the corn plant hopper, if they put hoppers on an infected plant and collect them, maybe 25 acquire the virus. So we don't know exactly what, but it's all genetically. So it's the genetic makeup of that individual that may, made it not acquire the virus, and this one is somehow different, and it can. And the, the best example for this is like when we talk about aphids that are plant, um, vectors of plant viruses, if you get a female that is a good transmitter, they are clonal. So that female will produce offspring that is just her all of them would be as good as the mother. When you work on a system that clonally, they are not reproduced, but sexually, you're gonna end up with that. Some that acquire and some that not. What genes are making this vector to be competent and that one in the same species, non, you need, you need to look for what genes make them different. Thank you. Okay. Are you in us? Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I just have a question. Do you please uh, know the underlying mechanism that is responsible for the reduction in the effectiveness of this vector as the life cycle, grow, the growth order, maybe from uh, the larva to the adult and um, stage like that? Because from your presentation, the localization of the vector in the, uh, the, of the pathogen in the vector is still the same, the mid gut and the and the fore gut. Mm -hmm. Why is it that the la the first instant larva are very more effective in acquiring infection from what we said, mm -hmm. and the other stages are somehow ineffective? Uh, well, there were uh, there was a, an image um, in which the infection in the mid gut on an individual at the larva le level was like very heavy. And then later on, when I'm showing that it has reached the salivary glands, are adults from the same experiment, of course it's not the same individual because you've dissected, but um, we're in the same experiment. Now you have salivary gland infection, but you, there's no longer a mid gut infection. So somehow that points to physiologically the mid gut of an adult that did acquire a slarvy and had a mid gut infected now that he had developed to adulthood, the midgut is no longer infected, so somehow that tissue tropism has changed and infection is no longer there. So that's what I also think is happening when acquisition occurs by an adult. Well, the midgut of that adult is already at that physiological state that doesn't support replication maybe no longer have the receptor for it to enter, or maybe fight off using the immune system much more better than the larvae did. And therefore, the, the infection doesn't really proceed, and an adult that acquire as adult cannot really become an efficient vector because it, no, it doesn't reach the salivary glands. But no one has looked to like come with evidence to say this is what is happening in the midgut of a larvae, this is what's happening on the midgut of an adult. No, these are kind of the hypotheses that the community has, but no one has looked at them. Thank you. Uh, in addition to that, don't you feel like maybe the uh, microbiome of the, of the larva, maybe because it has not fully developed, and as time goes on, the, the, the larva keep on feeding, and it, it uh, begins to develop the microbiome, and maybe the changes in the microbiome of the adult stage of the larva of the use of vector is what makes the, uh, the localization of the virus 
impossible. They had to adjust it compared to when it was at the early stage of the lab. Maybe, I don't know. Yeah, no, no one has looked at that, at the microbiome composition at different life stages. Thank you. Damos las gracias al doctor Vadillo. Gracias por invitarme. Ah, sí.